Hi, I'm Shay Oliver. Welcome to The Priority Paradigm. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've made radical changes in their lives for something more important. Today, I'm joined by Pam Moore, and she has a wonderful story to tell us. So without further ado, Pam, please take it away. Thanks, Shay. Um, I began my career as an occupational therapist. And I worked in hospitals, I worked in mental health, I worked in skilled nursing facilities. And I chose that career path originally because I knew I wanted to do something in medicine or health. I didn't really know what was available to me other than nursing or being a doctor. And I was not doing well in my pre-med classes at all. I was used to putting in like a certain amount of effort and doing well. And then suddenly I was like, oh, the this certain amount of effort isn't going to work anymore. And I, I wasn't willing, I guess, to work harder. And then um, nursing did not seem like a good option. My brother's girlfriend at the time was in nursing school. And she mentioned something about having to practice rectal exams. And I was like, I'm out, I'm not doing that. So <laughs> I heard about occupational therapy. And I was like, that sounds like a really great way to be able to use my creativity and to connect with people and be in a health profession. And eventually, if I had a family, I thought this could be a way for me to easily work part time because it's always easy to find work in this field. Sure. However, that's not what happened. So I worked as an occupational therapist for, gosh, I got my degree in 2002 and I was living in North Carolina at the time. I had gone to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, got my master's degree, was working. About four years after that, I decided to move back home, which is Rhode Island, and decided I want to be near my family. I feel lucky that I have like a really cool family, and we enjoy spending time together, and that's where I'm going to be. But right before I moved, I did bike tour Colorado. I was mm -hmm. road biking at that time, and I'd never seen Colorado before, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> this is amazing. So that kind of put the bug in my ear. Like, do I want to come back here someday? <laughs> and I'd been in Rhode Island for about a year when I decided to reevaluate things. At that time, I was getting kind of disenchanted with my work. I was finding more and more that the healthcare system, I just felt like a cog in a machine. It was all about productivity and the bottom line. Um, didn't always feel like I was helping people as I still enjoyed like the connection that you sometimes make with patients, but it just, my love for what I wanted to do and the creativity, I wasn't allowed to have a lot of the creativity that I wanted to have just within the, con the constraints of the healthcare system. Dang. So there was that. And then there was um, some horrible neighbors, which I hate I, that just caused me to break my lease. And then there was this feeling of at that time I was 29. And I was still single and I was like, maybe, you know, living in Rhode Island is not, you know, where I need to be for the rest of my life. Maybe being with my family as lovely as they are is not, maybe it's not as, as great as I thought it was going to be. So I made up my mind. I was like, you know, I kind of want to move to California. I had wanted to for a long time, but I'd always been too scared went on another it's all about bicycles for me i i was like the backing up i was not an athlete as a kid i was picked last for every team hated sports you know anything smaller than a soccer ball coming in my direction i would like flinch um and then it was like i started running one thing led to another i was doing triathlons i got into long road biking and then an iron man and then so so now i'm like so just to fill that in, in Rhode Island, believe it or not, I had a lot of friends quickly because you're kind of like, you know, birds of a feather flock together. You right. find another athlete and you're like, oh, you want to run? You want to bike? It doesn't matter if you're the same pace. It doesn't matter if you're doing the exact same workout. People are like, yeah, yeah, cool. We're like these weirdos in this culture of, you know, watching football on Sundays, like, which is not what I do. Um, sure. So I had some great friends and training buddies but I was still like I, I don't know so I went to Arizona I took a week off work I went to Arizona for another bike trip it was this wonderful tour across the state of Arizona and that was where I met a friend who lived in Boulder mm. he said don't move to California like Boulder is the best place um and I you know being from Pawtucket Rhode Island which 
it's got a lot of history and it's a great town, but I've never met anybody that's like, you got to move to Pawtucket. It's the best place. <laughs> um, <laughs> not a knock on my hometown, but it's just in New England, you know, you, you live there and you stay there and it's the culture of, you know, you just are where you are. Right. But now my friend is like, Boulder's the best place, especially for bike riding. You got to come out here. So I researched it and I'm like, yeah, this is a Mecca for endurance athletes. This yep. is a healthy lifestyle. I came out to visit and interview for some jobs and immediately I just fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. So, but I still, I was still really, really, really scared. I was like, how am I going to just pick up my whole life and leave? On the other hand, I was like, is it ever going to be easier than it is now? Like I'm single, I don't have any pets, like I have a few house plants, but I, I could do this. Right. And um, where, let's see. So I, yeah, I got back to, you know, back from my trip and I, like I said, I broke my lease. So I was living with my parents, which I thought was going to be a two week thing. It turned into a one month thing. And it was a bad month. It was a really bad month. I was like, I'm 29. I'm living with my parents. Like I hate my life. I also, my job was a contract. So I had like not renewed the contract. So I was working like just doing per diem hours here and there, but really not working. So my life was basically like in the toilet. And my mom was like, you know, I saw Elizabeth Gilbert on Oprah. And this was when Eat, Pray, Love had just come out. Okay. She's like, Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, the author of Eat, Pray, Love. She told Oprah that you need to figure out what you want. And then you need to say it out loud four times. And that's how you're going to get it. And I was like, that's a load of BS. Thank you, mom. And then she, <laughs> she left the room and I turned around and I faced the wall. And I said out loud four times, I want a boyfriend. Because that was what I really wanted. I had never had like this really serious relationship. And within a few days I decided I'm going to move to Boulder. I'm just going to do it. Um, so this was January, 2008. I packed up, I moved, I was alone. I drove cross country. It was super fun. Um, I got here and that friend who had said, you know, you should move to Boulder. He had a wife and two kids. So we were not going to be like best friends, you know, right. but he was really nice. He said, stay with us while you find a place. I was oh, staying. Wow. With him. Yeah. And, um, I found a place, I found some roommates. A couple weeks later, it was Valentine's Day and they were like, let's go to the bar. And I was like, sure. And my roommate said, what's your intention for the evening? And I said, intention, like what, what does it even mean? And she's like, what do you want to happen? And I said, that's, I'm gonna jinx it. And she said, no, 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 you have to say it out loud. So I was like, all right, I wanna, I wanna find love. And I was like pretending like I was kidding, but I was like super serious. And I met my husband that night at the bar. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was like, what's your, what's your type? And he said, well, you know, she should love the outdoors. She should be smart. She should be um, funny, beautiful. I said, I know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody for you. You should call me. So we ended up getting married like two years after that. And at that, so meanwhile, so I don't know if I mentioned backing up. I, I, came out here to visit and interviewed for all these jobs. And I had one, the one that seemed the best option to get me to Boulder was very tenuous. I had a pretty bad feeling about it. And I turned out to be right. Like within a week, it was sort of falling apart. And I was like, okay, so now I'm out here. I really don't have a job, but like I'm in love. And, uh, and this, this other job that I was really interested in Austin, you know, they called me like, a month after I got here and they were like, are you still interested? And I was like, Oh, like I want money. Yeah. But you know, I was like digging into my savings. It was stressful. Anyhow, got married. Um, fast forward, had my first kid in 2012 and I started working very, very part-time still as an occupational therapist, but I had started a blog in 2007. I love writing. And I started the blog just because I just was like, hey, I want to tell my stories. It'd be fun. And Oh, backing up when I met my husband at the bar, when we talked on the phone, the next, like the next day, he said, Hey, look, I feel like I need to tell you. He said, I Googled you. And, you know, I knew I liked him because if anybody else had said, I Googled you, I would have been like, oh, you're a stalker. But I was like, oh, you Googled me? That's, that's so sweet. And he said, I found your blog and you're hilarious. So I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's really sweet. So he has always encouraged my writing. Cool. So I'm working as an occupational therapist. I'm still blogging. And, you know, after you have a kid, you know, your whole life, it just changes. And it was like, what am I doing? Like, what am I, you know, every day kind of feels the same in some ways with a baby and you, 
at least it did for me. And it, you know, there are moments of joy and there are moments of despair. And there's a lot of this like in UI of like, what am I really making a difference? Do I matter? And you know, you're not getting paid. So it feels, you have all these questions about your self-worth and um, rarely does anything good happen? I think when you get online and you just sort of like fall down the rabbit hole of like, oh, click on this link, click on this link. But this one night, um, I guess my husband was out, baby was sleeping, I had a glass of wine and I'm online. And I made my way into finding out about this show called the Listen to Your Mother Show. And are you familiar with it? I have not heard of that, no. The Mother's Day celebration that happens in cities all around the country. And the thing is, local writers or people anybody who has written an essay about motherhood can audition and read their essay out loud to then be in this it's not exactly a performance it's a live reading and there'll be like 10 to 15 people on stage sharing their stories with the community oh very cool yeah and so i found out and, and the creator of it was somebody that i had admired like through her blog for a long time so then i found out oh my gosh her show is expanding to other cities and they wanted applicants so it was like five hours till the deadline and I applied and Boulder got it. And so I brought the Listen to Your Mother show oh. to Boulder in 2013. And that was sort of a turning point for me because that was when I started connecting with all these other writers between the women in the show. Actually, there was one man that year, um, the people in the show and then the other co-producers in all the other cities. Um, I started to see, oh, there are people out there making a living writing like this can actually be done. I hadn't, I don't think I'd ever met a writer before. I mean, I'm looking back to like, who were my role models? Who did I, I, I don't know. But all of a sudden it was like, this could be possible. I went to a blogging conference and, um, and actually there is something really special about putting your intentions out there because at the blogging conference, Cheryl Sandberg had just published um, Lean In and she did like a round table thing, like a keynote and a round table. And at the round table, we had to go around and say what you would do if you were not afraid. So I said I would get paid to write. And within six months, I had published my first article that, was, that I actually got paid for. It was an article in Colorado Runner Magazine. Cool. And then, yeah, and so that was, I guess, 2013. And since then, I've been published in all kinds of places. Um, last year, one of my articles was published in the Washington Post. I um, won an award for um, an essay that I wrote about my experience with Bell's palsy, which um, shitty experiences lead to interesting stories. So that was good. But um, but yeah, I so sorry, I'm kind of all over the place. But oh, no that was 2013 that I went to the conference and I started really getting into writing and figuring out well, who will pay me for my words. You know, this isn't just a hobby. This is something I want to do professionally. And it was very gradual. But then I had another child in 2014 and I kept on prolonging my maternity leave from the hospital. At that time I was working like three days a month or so. And they kept on saying, are you going to come back? And I kept saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my scrubs are like in a box under the bed. I'm not getting them out. And Ultimately, I, my husband was really encouraging me. He was like, take the time that you would have spent at work and, and write, just, just do it. You know, he gave me a ton of encouragement. I was like, you know, you're right. Cause after you pay a sitter for the time you spend getting there, the time you spend there, the time you spend getting back. And then the emotional drain of giving of myself to ill people, it's a lot. And so gradually this, writing thing started really happening for me in 2014 and um yeah now i write um i write a lot of parenting and fitness type content do copywriting content writing personal essays and it's and i and then as far as my speaking career i that was serendipitous but amazing because as much as i love writing. I also love, like one of the things I love about writing is that if somebody reads my words and says, wow, that really resonated with me, or I felt that way too, or thank you, thank you for putting into words the way that I wish that I could. And that like, even if just like one person says that, I'm like, oh, cool. Like that's amazing. But I really love connecting with people in person. And a friend of mine, maybe four years ago, and she said, um, I would love for you to submit a proposal. And I said, well, like on what? And she said, oh, like anything. So anything, I was like, all right. 
So I submitted a proposal to talk about imposter syndrome because are you familiar with imposter syndrome? I, no, I'm not. In, if you don't know the term, you've probably experienced it. It's that feeling of being a fraud when you're out of your comfort zone and you're like, oh, who am I to be, you know, writing a book, publishing an article, acting like an expert on this thing, which you probably are an expert on. You know, everybody, everybody feels this way, but, um, and I felt that way particularly um, often. I still feel that way as a writer and a speaker, but I had a lot of that with my um, athleticism. You know, I just, I probably had done at least one or two Ironmans when I finally was like, oh, I'm an athlete. And then I read about, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I bite just like I, I could be an athlete, right? Um, you know, for fun, I take the day off work and I bike up a mountain. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm an athlete. I hired a coach more than once to help me run, bike, and swim as fast as possible. Like, yeah, I'm probably an athlete, right? But I didn't know that because I, in my mind, was still this you know, unathletic kid that was picked last for everything. And right. when I finally was able to put a name on it, I was like, oh my god. All, I, all it was was imposter syndrome, and this is normal, and a lot of people go through this. And so I researched it and realized, oh, I've done all the tips and tricks they tell you to do. I've actually done them organically. And so my talk revolves around that. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, just to wrap up, the other kind of cool thing that happened along my journey was that on my 37th birthday, which was almost three years ago, um, my husband knows that he's not a good gift giver, right? So he was like, you know, what, what do you want? And I was like, I'm just gonna, I sent him a link. I might've even ordered the, I wanted a hoodie. I wanted a Lululemon hoodie. And I, I ordered it and it came and I quietly like put it in his office so he could wrap it for me for um, my birthday. So my birthday comes and I'm in bed on the morning of the birthday and uh, you know, he brings me the present and he gets out his phone to like record it. And I'm like, this is not like him to want to like record every moment of our lives, but whatever. And so I opened the surprise, the hoodie. And then my two year old at the time, who's now six, she's, she's like, mommy, there's a, there's a, something else in there. Ooh. He collected what he considered to be the best of my many blog posts from since 2007 and created a book out of them. And he hired um, our friends who are a copy editor and a designer to make it look nice, no grammatical errors, a beautiful cover. It has an ISBN number on the back. He got blurbs even, including from the creator of Listen to Your Mother Show, who's like my idol. Um, so suddenly on my birthday, I'm an author and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this. So I've done a lot of speaking too around like the book and, um, the, the imposter syndrome as it relates to athleticism, going to like, you know, stores like Runner's Roost, Complete Feed and things like that. So, sure. yeah, so that, um, I, uh, I can't say I have given away all my scrubs. Like I probably will at some point, I can't quite let go of them, but I haven't worked as an occupational therapist since. I guess 2014. But you're really following your passion now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Writing and speaking are where my heart is at. Well, is it is it comfortable to write in scrubs? <laughs> <laughs> well, you do, I mean, you could keep them that way and just kick back on the couch with the laptop and say, "Ah, eh, kept the scrubs, but I'm not using. I'm using them as writing." They have an elastic waist and they have a lot of pockets, so they're very functional. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first off, I have to defend men everywhere. You have to take back one thing, which is your husband. You said your husband's not a good gift giver. Well, in general, in general, I was just setting up the surprise. He just wins the award. I mean, good night. Yeah. That's an amazing gift. I love that. There's nothing, but I mean, there's no other better way that he could have said to me, like, do this. No, Joe, what a beautiful gift. I mean, that is, I've never heard some, I, you know, I know some people that, you know, you, you, you know, people, they're, they, they're always so good at coming up with the right gift and they're consistent on it. I don't think any of them ever touched that. No, because this was like a soul gift. This was like a heart. Yeah. Gift. I mean, this was, yeah, I believe in you times a million. I mean, oh, that, I've got yeah. lucky. But I, 
I your husband's, have, your husband's awesome. I'll just tell you, your husband's awesome. He is awesome. He <laughs> is. No, no doubt about it. But as far as, you know, bringing it back to the Listen to Your Mother show and my own mother, Listen to Your Mother is where it's at. Because my mother said, what do you really want? And I said, a boyfriend. And it led me. Yeah. <laughs> my mother and Elizabeth Gilbert and Oprah and my roommate, that all led me. <laughs> sure, it all led you to the same place. But it was a journey you had to take. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's just no way that you could have skipped a, a lot of the steps, I think. Who knows? And we'll no, talk about that. Well, let me ask you um, one question. Is you kind of work back in Rhode Island, trying yeah. to figure things out. What was happening? You, were, you had a sense of disquiet. You had a sense of, I'm not happy here. This isn't what I want to do with my life. Inside churning in your head, what did you really, really want out of your life? Oh, what a great question. I think, what did I really want? I like in retrospect, I like the first thing that comes to mind is like, oh, I wanted a family because that's what I have now. But I don't think I knew I wanted that. I was happy um, going on long bike rides and like doing what I wanted when I wanted. I was like terrified to start a family, but I knew I wanted like intimacy. I wanted some, a partner. I mm -hmm. wanted to share my life with somebody. So sure. I knew that for sure. And I've always wanted to like test my physical limits. Well, I say always, always since I started running when I was a teenager. So I knew, and that's still a big part of my life. I don't do long, long things anymore. I just, I don't have time, but um, I still like to, you know, do a 5k or a 10k or a sprint triathlon or something. But um, yeah, I wanted to experience like the limits of my body in nature. And I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I've always been like, Ooh, I kind of looking for a challenge. Like I'd be stagnant. So yeah, but I did. I really did want to find a person that could be like a real partner. That's very cool. That's very cool. So as you um headed down this path and started your writing career, even if it was your blog and then the the other things, what were the biggest obstacles inside of you that you had to overcome to continue mm -hmm. writing? I'd say the, there were many, <laughs> it's hard to narrow it down, but I think the biggest one was myself, like that voice in your head that's telling you what you're writing is not original, this has been done before, this isn't funny enough, this isn't smart enough, so-and-so could do it better, um, blah, 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 you know, who do you think you are, you know, all these little, these little doubts that, um, that was, that was pr pretty big for me. And as far as overcoming it, like I still sometimes struggle with that, but the only, and it's funny cause I think this is so similar to everything I've experienced as an athlete, you know, like all those times that you go out for a run and you're like, oh, my legs are sore. Oh, I'm tired. Oh my God. Da -da. There's nothing to do, but just do it. You have to forget about these little voices and just keep going, you know, one step at a time, one word at a time, whatever it is. And um, for me, it's all about like deadlines. So that's one of the reasons that I like to sign up for races and optimally a race that kind of scares me. Like my first marathon, I was motivated because I wanted to run the marathon, but I was also terrified of showing up on race day and not being able to finish. So like this fear, I don't recommend fear as a motivator, but it worked for me. Like, oh my God, what if I can't do it? I better get out there and do that training run. And same thing with writing. Like it's so much better for me if I have a deadline. Otherwise I can just, you know, while away the time. So, and the more, and you know, as with, ex, you know, any fitness routine, the more you do it, the, the more it flows, the better you get, the more of a habit you can make. It's I think it's all about habit. Like everything is more about habit than actual skill. Like, yeah, do I have a gift for writing? Yeah, somewhat. But a lot of it is just keep on going. Don't stop. Be stubborn. Be persistent. Ignore the voices and keep going. Because the more I write, the more easily I can write. And I notice, like, if I go on vacation and I don't write for a week or two, um, I'm a little rusty. Same thing as, like, if you haven't gone to the gym in a couple weeks, you come back and you're like, ooh, this effort's a little harder than it should be. But it's like, that's okay. Just get back on the horse and keep doing it. Hmm. So what's the biggest thing you're afraid of today in your writing? Oh, what a good question. Um, biggest thing I'm afraid of today. Hmm. I 
Well, I'll get back to you on that, but I do have a very <laughs> readily available fear about speaking because um, okay. speaking is also an area of my business that I want to grow. And okay. as far as speaking, I'm afraid of rejection. I'm afraid that I'll be like, Shay, I have a talk that might be great for your group or your event and that you'll be like, mm, no, thanks. And then I'll be like, which when you say it out loud, it's like, well, yeah, who cares? No, thanks. That's fine. It might not be a fit. <laughs> In my mind, I'm like, oh, they're going to think I'm dumb for asking or they're going to be like, who does she think she is to be an expert, so to speak, on imposter syndrome? Like, what does she have to say? That's, you know, it's that, you know, am I enough? Am I good enough? Do I? And, and which is crazy because I've done all this research on imposter syndrome and I talk openly, you know, with my friends and people about these things. And it's like, this is so normal. Everybody feels this way. It's not a big deal. And if I would follow my own advice, I would just be like, you know, fear, fear is part of life. You can't get rid of the fear. You have to just do things anyway. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you push yourself to do things anyway? What does that take? I think an attitude of like, I'm not going to try for everything at once. I'm going to take a step at a time. Like, don't worry about everything. Just worry about one thing. You know, send that email, make that phone call and focus on what I can control. Like I could be like, oh, I want to publish 20 articles and get three paid speaking gigs this month. I can't control those things, but I can go, I'm going to send out 20 pitches and I'm going to email 20 potential clients. You know, focusing on the things I can control and doing those things, that helps a lot. Sure. And, and same as like, you know, don't worry about the whole marathon. Take it mile by mile. Yep. Yep. Like when I moved to Boulder and I was terrified. Um, and I told my family, partly because they didn't want to see me go. And, and I told myself too, I, I couldn't say, oh, I'm going to be in Colorado for the rest of my life. Bye. I said, you know, I'm going for a year. I'll, I'll let, you know, we'll see what happens. Just one step at a time. Very good. Very good. So let's, let's head back to college and, mm -hmm. and maybe even high school. What made you choose going down a medical path to start your professional world? Um, that's a great question. I, um, you know, this was before I graduated from high school in 1996. So the internet was nascent, right? I didn't know what was out there. I knew you could be a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, and I love my own kids, but I'm not a kid person. I like kids. So like, I don't want to be, I don't have the patience for that. I'm not going to be a teacher. And like I said, I knew you could be a nurse, but aspects of that turned me off. I knew you could be a doctor. And I was really good at school. I was a good student. And my parents, my dad especially, was very encouraging of that. Um, he was, you know, it was like, yeah, be a doctor. And then, you know, when that didn't work out, he was like, well, marry a doctor, right? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, that, that's Jewish parents for you. That's not, you know, but like, you know, and I knew, oh, I could, yes, the professions that I knew about were like doctor, lawyer, my dad owns a scrap metal yard and that was a family business. So I, you know, I guess I could have gone into scrap metal, but that business doesn't really appeal to me. Scrap metal is look like hard work, real dirty. And like, I don't know, I, like I said, I love my family. I don't want to work in the same office. Sure. As them. So yeah, I knew about, my mother was, uh, she had been a teacher and was a stay at home mom. Those were the professions I really knew about. I'm like, I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I said to my husband, I said, I don't even know if I knew that writer was a profession. And he said, you know, and he made a good point. He was like, well, don't forget that like writing was pretty much in print back then. You would have been like a reporter or a magazine writer or something. And I was like, oh yeah, that's true. So um, yeah, there's so many, I, I love meeting people and finding out about their jobs because there's so many jobs out there that require so many different types of skills. And yeah, so doctor just seemed to me, hey, if you kind of like science, if you like people, you want to help people and you're smart and you want to have a secure um, income, that seemed totally reasonable to me. Yeah, I, I yeah. can totally, I can, I can see the yeah. logic to that. Until, until it didn't anymore, until I was like, I can't even do chem one. Who am I kidding? Like, this is not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I hear that. <laughs> so if you had a chance now, uh, today, 
to go back and talk to that young lady in college who's thinking there's these limited options and is trying to figure out where do I go in life? What would you tell her? I would say meet as many people as you can and don't be shy to ask them, hey, can I come to work with you? If not for a half a day or a day for like an hour, can I just see what you do? Um, that was one of the good things that I did do before I applied to occupational therapy school. And, and that was part of the application process, but I had to shadow um, occupational therapists in multiple practice settings. So I really got a decent feel for what the job would actually be like, but it never occurred to me to try to go, Hey, what other professions are out there that I might not know what they are. Um, I never even thought of that. So yeah, I would tell little Pam, just anyone who seems friendly, just ask them and, or, or ask them about themselves and their job. Most people I think love to talk about themselves. So <laughs> Yeah. Just ask them. Just ask sure. them. Do you want to meet um, the husband of... of oh, Shay? yes. I definitely want to say hi. So meet Shay. I talked about you in the, in the interview. This is Dan. Hello. Hi, Dan. Congratulations. You win the best gift ever given award with the book. <laughs> awesome. I had to say she did all the work. I just put it together. But No, he didn't. Yeah, but he was you, always like, oh, I have work on the weekends. And I was just like, oh, okay. No, it was a lot. I think it was a lot of work. It was a, no, I know what it is. I've published a book. It's a lot of work. So um, congratulations, you win. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what is it, what's it called? I don't even know. It's about people going kind of off the beaten path. Cool. Priority paradigm? That's correct. Yeah. Correct. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, if you're still doing this in a few years, you should interview him because we are planning to take our kids to Costa Rica for a year and uh, see what happens. I, uh, you, um, you are now on the list for a future interview. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, nice to meet you, Shay. It was nice to meet you. Oh, very cool. So, yeah. so interestingly, you actually have a plan to take off. We do. And you can change from doing your dream job to go potentially experience something different. What drives that? Uh, to be totally honest, Dan, my husband, it was his idea. But um, I have to say, I, it's the idea, the more I've sort of like played with it, the more it's grown on me. He, you know, I, I just thought he wants to do this so badly. I'm not going to be like a dream crusher. And it's not like living abroad would be the worst thing. But, you know, like I said, I do love challenges, but I also love routine. Like, I like, I just, I don't know. I kind of like knowing what's happening next. And I like my friends and I like our community and I love this town. But as I'm sure you've noticed too, like Boulder's getting more and more crowded. Um, even in the last like four years, I noticed a difference. So I'm like, oh, it'd be nice to kind of leave and refresh and come back but also just how lucky are we to have the opportunity to both he's a software developer so we can work remotely and give ourselves and our kids this cultural experience that it's like what a gift that we could have this why don't we take advantage of it so seeing it from that point of view and realizing like this could just be such a cool opportunity to see something different that most people will not get to have because their jobs don't allow this flexibility i'm like wait a minute why wouldn't i do this this is going to be awesome very cool. Very cool. So let's let's touch on this dream concept for just a second. You you started off college like so many of us do, saying, "Oh, okay, got to have the job, got to have the money coming in." Um, and then someplace you said, "I want to do something different than what I went to school for, what yeah. I've been working on." How did you get in touch with the love of writing? Um, I I think I've always loved writing. Like as a child, I wrote. I remember being like as young as eight and journaling about stressing me out. And I think that, I mean, I, I come from writers and um, like my dad's cousin, who's kind of like an aunt to me, she published a book a couple of years ago. And um, my grandmother was an academic, like, you know, women didn't go to college and, you know, she graduated in 1932. So I think that's like somewhere in my blood. And I can see it in my daughter, my six-year-old got, um, each kid got their own special award at kindergarten graduation. And she, yeah. got, she got aspiring author. Oh, and no. Just, yeah, that, I have a proud mom moment. So, oh, no doubt. Yeah, she's a big writer and list maker, just like me. So I've always loved writing. And blogging is one of those things, especially when I, you know, didn't have kids and I could, like, stay up until now, like, 11 would be absurdly late for me. But if I started a blog post, there was no such thing as, like, not finishing it that night. Because that was one of those things for me where I would get into flow, which, um, do you know about the concept of chicks smell high and the, and the flow? 
we talked a lot about that in occupational therapy school, like um, for your watchers or your viewers who don't know, flow is that state that you get in when you're at like the just right challenge. It's hard enough to be interesting. It's easy enough to be manageable and you lose track of time and you lose track of yourself and you're just totally present. And for me, writing was, especially when I started blogging and you can, I can type really fast. Um, I would just get in flow and nice. you know, I wouldn't stop until I hit submit on that blog post. So I think that's how I felt, you know, just rediscovered or discovered my love of writing. But as far as like, should this be a career? Should I really do it? Um, finding that was more a matter of um, feeling into it rather than thinking. Like, I think- Oh, say more, say more about feeling into it. I love that phrase. We, I think as a culture and me specifically, I'm inclined to think with my head and make a list. Okay, pros and cons of everything. I remember applying, I applied early, just like I said, I want to know what's happening next. I applied early decision to college mm -hmm. because I thought instead of having all these options and waiting until May to figure out what I'm going to do, I know that I want to go to this, you know, one school or the other. I'm going to narrow it down and apply in October and no in December. And I made um, a chart of all the pros and the cons of my two favorite schools. But then I remember even being as young as I was like 17, kind of putting the chart away and just being like, screw the chart. I know which school feels like the school I want to go to. And I had the same experience when I was applying to graduate programs. And um, I visited a, a couple different campuses. But when I got to Chapel Hill, I was like, this feels right. And again, I had that same experience when I visited Boulder. It was like, I don't know what it is about this place, but I feel something here. Mm -hmm. And so as far as like, what should I do with my career? Writing felt like the thing to do. It felt like it was me. It felt, yeah, I think just being quiet and like seeing how you feel and forgetting about, well, what could be most lucrative? What is more secure? What is, um, you know, it's easy to show up at a party and say, I'm an occupational therapist, what do you do? Whereas it took me probably a year and a half or two years to be able to introduce myself to a stranger and say I was a writer without being like, oh my God, there's a <laughs> somewhere and they're gonna be like, you are, no, you're not. You know, it was like, I'm a writer. <laughs> I have a really good friend who I would be like, I remember meeting somebody at a party when I was writing a little and my kids were really small and um, this person was like, what do you do? And I was like, nothing. I was, and then I was like, no, I mean, I stay home with my kids. I mean, I'm a mom. And my friend was like, she's a writer. And my friend was like, she's a really good writer. And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. So um, cool. yeah, besides feeling into things, I think it's really important to surround yourself with people who lift you up and who see the best version of you and who want you to be the best version of you. Mm -hmm. And I have made an effort to, you know, if there are people in my life that aren't elevating me and that I don't want to elevate, I try to uh, trim the fat, so to speak. You know, life's too short. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, that's very cool. So um, I'm going to put a question to you because you're also a parent, and even though yours are young. Um, so you've headed down the path of this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to college. I'm supposed to go get this career. What are you or how are you trying to push your kids forward in life? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I guess that's a really good question. Because on the one hand, I'm like, I don't want to push them into anything. I just want them to find stuff on their own. I think the more you get pushed, the more you'll pull back anyway. I think that's human nature. And I can see that, especially in my older child's personality. So um, I don't want to push her. But that said, I might have mentioned Brown University a couple times because like my grandmother went there and my family is in that area and my daughter came home on the bus the other day and she actually said she goes oh me and this other girl on the bus both want to go to Brown and I'm like wait you're in the first grade and you're talking about college like oh my god I was just kidding never mind I don't care when you go to college <laughs> and you can only go to Brown if you get a full scholarship <laughs> we cannot afford it so I want my kids to I mean, I guess I push them by like, if they're interested in something, I, I let them have more of that, you know, and um, 
Well, let me rephrase the question then. What do you want for your children? Yeah. You're breaking up a little bit. A uh, lovely connection here. So um, let me just re rephrase the, the question here. What do you want for your children? Okay, that's a good question. All right, I want them most of all, if, mm, there's so many things, but I want them to be unapologetically whoever they are. Ooh, just, nice. Yeah. nice, I love that answer. That's, that's absolutely a, a beautiful answer. Um, and it's a challenge <laughs> to get yeah. there. Um, uh, th that's fantastic. So um, you're, I love the work you're doing and I love the term imposter syndrome because we, so many of us have that experience. Oh, I've been doing ABC for years, but I, I'm not ABC. That's, some, you know, I'm not that good. I, I love that. So if you have an opportunity to tell somebody who's thinking about changing their life and heading down a path where they're going to experience that, mm -hmm. what's the one thing you would tell them? Let's see. I'm trying to think. So I have a little acronym that's four things that people should do if they're dealing with imposter syndrome. So let's do that. Let's do that. What are the four things that you okay. tell them? So it's LEAP. All right. So LEAP, obviously LEAP, but it stands for the L is let it go, which means let go of perfection. There's not a perfect time. There's not perfect circumstances. There's not a perfect product. There's not a perfect piece of writing. You could always go back and revise it. Always, always, always let all that go. Okay. E is express yourself, which means tell somebody. And if you don't feel comfortable telling somebody, maybe just journal about it. But getting it out there, putting words on it, mm. always helps. A is act as if. I did a ton of this as an athlete. Just, you know, waking up and it's like, well, would a real athlete press news or get out there? Would a real athlete call off the workout because of bad weather or get out there? Just bake it till you make it. And then the P is for positive self-talk. Wow. You know, forget about this. Oh my God, can I do it? I don't know if I can do it. Yes, you can. Like I have a mantra, it's yes, I can. It's easy, it's simple. The more I do it, the more it's just a habit. And it's like, that's kind of my default is whatever it is. Yes, I can. Very cool. Let me, let me touch on that for just a second here. So positive self-talk, part of that is, um, you know, what we call in the communication world, uh, meta perspectives. You've got what you think somebody else is thinking. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with the, wow, uh, be it my mom, be it my friend, be it the other athletes. How do you deal with what you believe they're thinking? I try to remember um, that nobody is thinking about you the way you're thinking about you. Like as much as I'm obsessed with what they might be thinking about me, they're probably just dealing with their own selves. They are way too busy to care what I'm doing and just focusing on myself and trying to be like, you know what? I just got to be the best version of me today. And haters are going to hate, you know, <laughs> <They're> control. <laughs> that, that is, that is absolutely, absolutely accurate. So this is kind of a cool conversation to hear somebody who's uh, also fallen in love with Colorado because I'm one of those stories too. Yep. Um, and I'm also one of those stories going, why are all you other people following in love coming here? I'm tired of you people coming here. I know, I know. <laughs> but, I, but I understand. <laughs> so, um, but now you've, you know, you have a very cool story. And I'm gonna ask you one of those really broad questions. And take a second if you need to, but what's the most important thing in life? Oh, I don't need a second. Okay. I, relationships, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I actually, one of the best weekends of my life recently was a girl's weekend um, in honor of my upcoming 40th birthday. And I had some of my best friends all together at once from different aspects of my life. And I was just like, you know, you know, of all the things I've done and all the things that I want to do, you know, I want to get published in the New York Times. I want to be, you know, speaking to large audiences. I want to be this. I want to be that. Who, who cares? Like, of course I care, but I, nothing compares to feeling connected to people, to the people that matter. I really can't put anything above that. Very cool. Very, very excellent answer. This has been a fantastic 
fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed learning about what you're doing. And uh, okay, I got to be honest, I'm just like blown away by the husband's present. That is one of the coolest <laughs> presents I have ever heard of. We actually um, kind of co-wrote a blog post about that. Um, if you're, if you know somebody that's like, hey, I want to do that for my wife, partner, whoever. We, um, I think it's still up on the website Beyond Your Blog. Um, it's called, I think it's called How I Secretly Turned My Eight Years Worth of My Wife's Blog Posts into a Book. I think that's okay. what we named it. Okay. People like Pam Moore, Beyond Your Blog. You should find that article. Okay. Well, I'll make sure that it gets linked on the. Uh... Yeah. you know, the page on my website to, yeah. to this uh, conversation. So um, if people want to get a hold of you mm -hmm. uh, or learn more about you, what are the best ways to go about doing that? Thank you for asking. The best thing is my website, pam-more.com. Great. Um, yeah, if you're on Twitter, I'm Pam Moore Writer. Okay. Yeah, those are two excellent ways to find me. Outstanding, outstanding. So um, I always end... All of these uh, conversations with the same question. Okay. And the question is, what question did I forget to ask you? Ooh. Oh man, what question did you forget to ask me? Um, well, here's a question that I like to ask people. I, okay. I'm always curious, what is your morning routine? Do you think that your viewers would want to hear what my morning routine is? I see the cup of coffee, or what I assume is a cup of coffee right. in your hand. So, yes, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's hear your morning routine. Well, I don't actually have a morning routine. It depends on the morning. So, yeah, I, I think that you, you think, oh, like, successful people do this, or successful people, blah, blah, blah. Well, like, people do whatever works for them. And I think as far as the morning routine, the question isn't it's so much like, well, what do I do? It's sort of just accepting, like, well, what works for me? And every day might not be the same. But I do, on an ideal morning, I get up before my kids. Because as much as I'm a night person, I feel totally scattered if I can't wake up before them. That's so nice. ideally, I wake up way before them, and I meditate for at least five minutes. And then I work out for anywhere from like 20 minutes to an hour, just depends on the day. And um, that is my optimum way to start a day. And it, yeah, I almost always have coffee. <laughs> That's how I know I'm getting sick if I don't feel like coffee. Oh, well, yeah, no, if I didn't have coffee, I'd be in, I know I'd be in trouble. Something's yeah. really wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Well, Pam, thank you very much for spending this time with me today. I greatly appreciate it and I have absolutely enjoyed this. Thank you, thanks for having me, it was super fun.